Reading in Acts chapter 2 from verses 14 down through 41 this morning. Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 14. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of Yahweh. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of Yahweh shall be saved. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. For David says concerning him, I foresaw, the, I foresaw Yahweh always before my face, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you show your holy one to see corrupt, nor will you allow your holy one to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says himself, Yahweh said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off as many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And may the Lord add his blessing to the reading from his word this morning. You may be seated. I want to begin today with a prologue. Last night I was in bed 
and I don't know what you think about when you go to bed, but I'm thinking of the message throughout the week. And so going through the outline and kind of that kind of stuff. And while I was meditating on, on the outline, I felt like the Lord kind of pointed something out to me. And it becomes a prologue. So I'm actually going to begin today from uh, Luke chapter 5. Luke 5. And uh, beginning in verse 1, it says, So it was, as the multitude pressed about him, that is Jesus, to hear the word of God, that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats standing by the lake. But the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Then he, that is Jesus, got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, that's Peter, and asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the multitude from the boat. When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and have caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the boat, in the other boat, to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he, he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. Acts chapter 2. The fulfillment of that prophecy. Peter was now getting ready to fully comprehend what Jesus had just told him three years earlier. If I said to you today, three and a half years from now, you're going to preach a message, and 3,000 people are going to come forward, and they're going to accept Jesus and they're going to be immersed in the name of Jesus on that same day. What do you think? You up to it? Yeah, dude, that's me. Yeah! No. I don't want a church of thousands. I'm, I'm content with, with small, intimate bodies of believers. I can't imagine. Oh, I've been there, actually. The previous church I was at before we started this one was up to 180. I, the, the admin part of it just... You were there, Brian. You know, the admin part of it just drove me bonkers. It's not my, I can't imagine what it would be like. 3,000 souls instantly in the church. Babies. Babies. Not strong believers, babies. But now we're going to see it. Today we get to witness the witness that Jesus promised that they would be. We've spent four weeks in the book of Acts so far, two weeks already in Acts chapter 2. And as we've considered this, we saw in, in chapter 1 how Jesus had, before he was ascended, given a command to the, to the apostles to wait. They had to wait in Jerusalem until they received, they were endued, they were enclosed from Luke 24, right? They were cloaked with the power of God, the, the power of the Holy Spirit, we're told that the, the Holy Spirit would come upon them, okay? They would be immersed with the Holy Spirit. And when that power came upon them, that they would be then witnesses. Say again? Okay. Engulfed. They would be, yes, they would be engulfed with it. And they would become witnesses at that moment. But they had to wait. And they, and they weren't told how long they were going to have to wait. Ten days later, Shavuot came. Shavuot is the, the feast of um, ingathering, a feast of harvests, the first of them. Um, we know it as Pentecost came to be. And Jews from around the world 
And the converts, as we talked, even someone mentioned about the proselytes coming, but they're converts to Judaism. So Jews, whether they were of Israel or whether they were um, proselyte, proselyted into it, came into Jerusalem to celebrate this Jewish feast. Okay? That's important for us to understand. This is a Jewish event, a Jewish happening going on at this moment. And so the Holy Spirit comes upon them, right? And when he comes upon them, we see that there was this sound of a rushing mighty wind that was filled the whole house. They were, had little um, cloven tongues of fire that would be upon them, and they spoke with other languages. And they, we know there were other languages, again, because from the, men from Bithynia and Cappadocia and Mysia and all these other places heard them speaking in their languages. And we're also told, as we're going to see this morning as we begin with verse 14, and we mentioned last week, that when Peter speaks, he utters clearly. And so the word where the Holy Spirit would give, gave them utterance, literally the word there is apothengomai, which was to give a clear utterance. Okay, And so Peter is going to apothengomai, to the people now, okay? And he's going to give a clear utterance to the people for they, they can hear what he's going to be speaking. And so we transition then today into that, that epithangomai, if you would, that clear utterance that he was going to be giving to them. And it's, in my brain, it's broken into two sections. We got the situation, and then we got the solution. So first of all, the situation. What's the situation? Well, we got Peter's proclamation to the, pe to the people. There's two parts. First of all, he gives them a proclamation regarding the coming of the Spirit. That's what gathered all the people. They heard that rushing mighty wind coming. They heard this freight train, if you would. They didn't know what a freight train was, but they heard this kind of sound coming through. And everybody gathers to the upper room where they're at. And so the, the apostles come on down. Now all of a sudden these guys who were afraid are full of power, they're coming out, they're beginning to proclaim the gospel, right? And so now Peter has their attention, and he begins to explain to them what's actually going on. In, in his explanation of that, he quotes from the, from the prophet Joel, in Joel chapter 2, verses 28 to 32. And so it is an exact quote as he goes through, but as you'll note um, in it, it it's not totally fulfilled. And so we kind of wonder, like, hmm, what's this all about? It says that your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams. Um, it says that the um, blood and fire and vapor smoke will be signs in the earth. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood. That all didn't happen at that moment. You say, what was going on? So the first thing I want to talk about real quick on this one, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but I want to address it, and that is the, because we talked about a lot in Daniel, with partial prophecies, partial fulfillment of prophecies, or dual fulfillment of prophecies, if you would, split fulfillments of prophecies. John the Baptist was who? Elijah. But was he really? No, he wasn't Elijah, but he came as the spirit of Elijah on the Mount of Transfiguration, when Peter, James, and John were there, when Jesus took them up there, who did they see? Elijah. Was it really Elijah? Yes, it was Elijah. And so in Revelation, we're told two witnesses are going to come. Now, there's a great debate on who those two witnesses are. Okay? I happen to think they're going to be Moses and Elijah. I think that's why they were there on the Mount of Transfiguration. Could it be um, Enoch and Elijah? Because the two of those never, quote-unquote, went through the portal of death. Could be. But in either way, whether you take it as Enoch and Elijah or Moses and Elijah, who's going to be there? Elijah. Make sense? So we're told that before Jesus comes, Elijah will return. Okay? And so, um, so Elijah came, the spirit of Elijah came in John the Baptist, but he did also come physically on Mount Transfigurations, and he will come physically again during the time of the end. Okay, so they're partial, split, whatever you want to call it, fulfillments of prophecy. So that's what's going on here in Joel. So partial fulfillment, but the rest of it still to be played out in the end times. But there's another part of this that I want to go to. And so um, if you happen to have your finger in Joel 2, 
Um, I'm going to read it real fast because it'll take a time. Then it goes to the very end of, chapter, uh, of the chapter, verse 32, because, again, this goes from 28 to 32. But Peter leaves off the last of the, uh, Peter leaves off the, the last of the verse. So I'm going to read verse 32. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of Yahweh shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be deliverance. As Yahweh has said, among the remnant whom Yahweh calls. Among the remnant whom Yahweh calls. There's also a concept of what's going on here. Where God is, again, delivering Israel through a remnant. The nation of Israel will never cease to be. In the Reformation period, there were many who doubted. Theologies were created even before the Reformation period where the church became Israel. Israel was the church. Replacement theology. You see it in Reformed churches where they declare that the church has taken all of the covenants of Israel. It's not the case. God made promises to Israel. Uh, only if you could destroy his covenant with the sun, moon, and the stars would you be able to destroy his covenant with Israel. Perfect plan. You want to destroy God's plan? Build a bunch of missiles, take out the sun, the moon, and the stars. Take out the sun, moon, and stars. You destroy God's plan with the sun, moon, and stars. You can wipe out God's plan of redemption. What's the problem with that? You'll be dead. <laughs> and it really won't matter. God is, at this moment, through Peter and these apostles, calling a remnant of his Jews to believe. That's why, in the book of Romans, when Paul says, you know, about that, he wished he could be condemned for all of his, um, his, his brethren of Israel. God wasn't w turning his back on Israel. Rather, he was initiating the church. Okay, two full thing going on here. Okay, let me put, click my button here, right? Two full thing happening. God was maintaining a remnant of Israel, but he was also initiating the beginning of the church, establishing the church. And so, important part that's here, okay, this remnant that's here. So, there was the coming of the Holy Spirit, but secondly, it was the coming of Messiah, and that's really the, the most important part. And so, what Peter begins to talk about is how God attested to Jesus as being Messiah, the attestation of God, of Jesus' Messiahship, through the, 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 the miracles, the wonders, and the signs. And on your sermon note sheets, if you have that, I have all the references for these and how these come together. I'm not going through all those, okay? Um, but to suffice it to say that wonders are acts of power. Um, or miracles are. Miracles are acts of powers, okay? The signs were symbols um, of significance, sign, significance, where you would know something was being attested to, okay? That this, this happened, okay? So if... Um, you look at a document today, and it has a seal on it, okay, and it's been stamped with the seal of a notary. The notary stamped that document with his seal or her seal in order to what? Verify, validate, give attestation to the, the validity of this document. Does that make sense? That's what God was doing. He was giving attestation to the validity of the messiahship of Jesus through the, the miracles, the wonders, and the signs. The, um, the wonders and the signs, you never see wonders without signs in, in the New Testament. They go together, signs and wonders, okay? The crucifixion of the cross. But you guys handed them over. We'll come back to that in a moment. But the one that God raised up, the one who God attested to as being messiah, you guys... You killed him. You hung him on the cross. In that statement, there's also a statement that you handed him over to 
The Gentiles. Think about that. It was the Gentiles who hung on the cross, not the Jews. Your Messiah came. God gave you unequivocal proof of who he was. You rejected him. Handed him over to the Gentiles to be killed. But God raised him from the dead. God raised him from the dead as he had proclaimed through the prophet David. Wait a second, the prophet David? I thought it was King David. King David was a prophet. And David wrote prophetically in the Psalms. And so Peter quotes two different Psalms of David to talk about it. Yahweh said to my Lord. Yahweh said to my Lord. Jesus talked about that when he was on the earth. And he says, whose son would the son of David be? Or who's, who's, whose son would Messiah be? And they said, David. Well, then why does David say, Yahweh says to my Adonai, Yahweh says to my Lord, sit here upon my, my, right, my right hand. The point is that David was declaring that Yahweh was talking to his, David's Adonai, his Lord. So that there had to be then another Lord when he's talking about Messiah, that his son who was going to come would also be his, his Lord. You tracking with that? And then David then declared, you will not allow my body to see decay. But Peter says, but over there, we got what? We got the tomb of David. His body's dead. His body is decaying. It wasn't about David. And so prophecy was given regarding the resurrection of Messiah. And so Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. We're here to bear witness of it that this actually happened, another attestation of the validity of Jesus' Messiahship. And then you come to the end, where we get to this point, where the accusation of the prophet, or uh, of the apostle, and you killed him. Could you imagine this moment? How to make friends and influence people. You're going to preach this powerful message, and about the prophet Joel, and about David, and all this kind of stuff, and the Messiah came... And you, you can almost picture the finger going out. You killed him. Paul's going to do something like this later on. And they're going to pick him up and try to kill him. But God's got a plan for Peter and the other apostles at this very moment. He's establishing his church. And as Peter is proclaiming his message, the Holy Spirit's at work. We're going to talk about this next. But the Holy Spirit's at work. And so we have the contrition of the crowd via this holy, the convicting work of the Holy Spirit. Because they come back and they say, what must we do? Oh, no. Instead of like, hey, get out of here. Who do you think you are? accusing us of doing that. I don't live here. I live in Bithynia. I wasn't here to crucify him. I'm from Cappadocia. I wasn't any part of that. But they heard the message. They heard the challenge. And they asked, what must we do? Well, the convicting work of the Holy Spirit, we saw this when we, a couple weeks ago when we talked about the ministry of the Holy Spirit, when we talked about the filling of the Holy Spirit. That in John chapter 16, Jesus said that when he left, he would send the Holy Comforter. And that the purpose of the Holy Comforter wasn't just for us believers. But he had a purpose for the people in the world. That he would convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and judgment. Of sin. Why? Because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness, because they go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because of this ruler of this world is judged. It is the Holy Spirit's job, not mine, not yours, to convict men of sin. Does that make sense? You can declare all you want, but the conscience work belongs to the Holy Spirit, not you. You can speak all you want, but unless the Holy Spirit's working 
unless they are responding to it, nothing's going to come of it. Romans 10, verse 13 to 17, we read about the, you know, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But that's all precipitated on three questions. How then, sh how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? How, how, how? How will they hear unless somebody is what? Sent. Well, that means the Holy Spirit's got to do what? Raise somebody up to what? To go and to preach. Let me stop for a moment and ask you a question on the side, a little side question that's free, right? Have you ever felt burdened to go tell somebody about Jesus, about redemption, and you didn't do it? How shall they hear unless someone is sent? Again, if I said to you three and a half years from now, God's going to cause a massive revival through you, do you believe it? Or would you say, oh, man, no way, that can't be me. Peter was a what? A fisherman. His cohorts were fishermen. Matthew was a, yeah, tax collector, favorite guy. He's the IRS guy. He comes to your house, and you're glad to see him. It doesn't happen that way. These, weren't the, the, these apostles weren't the guys that you would have expected to be the authorities. They were going to be the guys standing up to preach a revival, or a great awakening, if you would. It wasn't really a revival. It was more of a revival, Right? There was a coming to life rather than a return to life. But they had to obey. They had to believe. They had to believe that Jesus could do what he declared that he would do. Follow me, Jesus says, and I will make you fishers of men. Do you believe? Do you believe that he can make you a fisher of men? I always love the, the sign down on uh, Central Church of Christ as you go down um, Calhoun Expressway. It was on the left-hand side. It said, you catch him, he'll clean them. We are worrying about cleaning before we were about catching. But you catch him, he'll clean them. It's a great quote. He's called us to do what? To catch him. But he didn't say we have to do it on our own. He says, follow me and what? I will make you. Not follow me and you have to become. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Do you believe he can do that? Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Peter was proclaiming the word of God. To the people. Isn't that kind of cool? The first message was expository, sort of. He was using the word of God, going back to it, saying this is what it says in the scriptures, where everything's consistent, this is how it's playing out. The convicting work of the Holy Spirit. But then we had then the response of the people, what shall we do? They said, and what shall we do? Jesus had talked to people because they had asked him, what shall we do? But in John chapter 6, and Jesus said, this is the work of God, that you believe in him who you sent. There's only one thing you can do. People want to say, oh, no, no, that's a work. And so they, they want to say that you can't even believe on your own, that God's going to put the faith in you. He makes you believe, and then so it's not even a work. But that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said there's only one thing, one work, if you want to call it a work, that you can do. And that is what? Believe. Acts 16, when Paul was there with the Philippian jailer, and the Philippian jailer runs in and says, what must I do to be saved? And he said, nothing, you can't do anything. You're either, you're either elect or you're not elect. He didn't say that. What must I do to be saved? Believe. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved in your household. That's an amazing statement. People want to make that more out of it. But that's talking about the impact of the father in his home. When you turn, 
Dads, when you turn wholeheartedly to Jesus Christ, everybody in your house takes note. Acts 17, 2 to 5 is an important verse, though. There's others I could, I could put out, and that is a reminder to us that not everybody who hears the message is going to respond. What must I do? Acts 17, 2 to 5, we read as Paul um, went into the Sabbaths, right? It was custom. He went into them for three Sabbaths, reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, saying, This Jesus, whom I preach to you, is the Christ, the Messiah. And some of them were persuaded. And a great multitude of devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women joined Paul and Silas. There was a lot of people who what? Who got saved. They accepted the message. But we don't stop there. But the Jews, who were not persuaded, became envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace, and gathering a mob, set all the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason. Paul, power of the Holy Spirit, proclaiming the message of Jesus, a lot of people responded. But a lot of people didn't. So go back to Jerusalem. We're gonna, we're, we know, because we've read the whole, the whole account, right? 3,000 souls get saved. You think there was only 3,000 people in Jerusalem that day? That tells you, though, that there was many who what? Who didn't believe. Or at least didn't make the decision that day. It's always important for me to remember. Again, I can't save anyone. That's not my job. My job is not to save anybody. My job is only to what? Say again? Tell them about Jesus. Tell them the truth. Speak the truth in love, but speak the truth. It's their job to respond. It's God's job to convict them, to draw them, but their job to respond. So the solution, they ask the question, what shall we do? So Peter responds to them. Peter gives them a declaration. First of all, you need to change your thinking. Repent. Now again, people hear that word repent, and they think it's doing things. It has nothing to do with doing things. It's the Greek word metanoao uh, is, the, is the, the verb. Metanoia is the noun part of it. Change the way you think. Change your thinking process. Meta, change, nuos, your mind. Change your mind about things. Change your mind about Jesus. That's why he declared that, that God has made this Jesus both Lord and Messiah. Now, that's important. God has made this Jesus both Lord, Adonai in the Hebrew, and Messiah, the anointed. We love to take Jesus as Messiah because that's the Redeemer. We love to be purchased out of sin. And then we love to do what? Live our own lives. However we want. But Peter said, God has made him Lord and Messiah. You don't just receive him as fire insurance. But you receive him as the Lord of your life. He who is in charge. For Americans, that's very hard. Because we want to be our own masters. We want to be our own lords. Lords of our own life. We're going through Ruth in Sunday school. I invite you to come. It's going to be a great study. It's a participation, class participation thing. It's not just me teach. And so it was really good this morning. And one of the things I see from the book of Ruth in that as well is this whole concept of um, Ruth submitting to the lordship of Yahweh. She understood what that meant of, of coming and in, 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 um, following what his declarations were. And it was played out in the fact that she was willing to trust Yahweh through the um, guidance and, and directions of Naomi. 
and then in the, the, the movements of Boaz, the kinsman redeemer. Am I willing to take Bob off the throne? And allow Jesus to sit firmly there. And do what he tells me to do. About Jesus, change the way you think. About righteousness, it's not by works but by faith. I don't have time to get into this. Um, but again, he's talking to Jews. Jews looked at the fact that the righteousness would be coming through what? Fulfilling the, the law. And they had to change the way they thought about that. Because they, they weren't going to be able to come up with their own righteousness. Rather, the law, as we see later in the New Testament, Paul's going to tell us about that and give us understanding that the law was just a schoolmaster to, to point us towards sin, that we needed a redeemer. We needed a savior. And so Yahweh declares in Isaiah 43 that he alone is the savior. And so... When Peter says he's both Lord and Messiah, I sometimes wonder what um, word is there for Lord and Messiah, whether it's Adonai or whether he declares him as Yahweh at that moment. I can't state that. But you come to this next part, and that is like we talked about for communion this morning, that you have no righteousness of your own, but rather it's got to come by faith. And so Romans 10 Paul was talking about Israel. My heart's desire for prayer to God for Israel is that he may be saved. For I bear witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. That's what they had to come to believe. Secondly, they needed to be immersed. Now, I know it says, again, be baptized. But again, if you've been here long enough, you understand the word baptism Baptize is not a real word. It is a transliteration of a Greek word. It's the Greek word baptizo. Baptizo means to dip, dunk, or immerse. So Dunkin' Donuts is baptizo donuts. So like when you take that Oreo cookie and you in the milk, you baptizoed your, your Oreo. That's what it means. Well, why do we have the word baptism? I don't have a long time to spend this, but it's because, again, of, the, of the, the teaching of the church past that began to baptize babies, sprinkle babies, to wash away original sin. That's not in the Bible. And so when they translated into English, so you've got the Church of England going to be translating the Bible into English and you're the priest. And you don't immerse people after they accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. You sprinkle babies, regardless of whether they believe in Jesus or not. And they join the church. They, they become part of the church because of that. What are you going to do? King James wants an authorized version. He's already, not he, but England, has already had Wycliffe killed, and Tyndale killed, Coverdale killed, because they were separatists and they didn't teach what the church taught. What are you going to put in there? Now we come up with the word baptism. Baptize. So I like when I see that, just like when I see the capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D in, in the Bible, I know that's Yahweh's name. He has given us his name, Exodus chapter 3, for us to, to use. And so I'm not afraid of speaking his name. I'm not going to use it um, uh, without purpose. But he gave us his name to be declared. So when I see that, I say it. When I see the word baptism, I want to put in the word immersion. When I see baptize, immerse. Because that's what it means. And I think we miss a lot of understanding of what is going on. Now, Jews got it because right there, on, uh, I was going to picture, picture up, but I knew I didn't have really a lot of time. On the southern entrance to the temple, where they would go up, and this is where the, um, Peter and the apostles are standing, there were McVeighs on either side, and McVeigh is a baptistry, what we call a baptistry, a Duncan tank. Okay? They were like small little pools of water, cisterns of water, where people would come up and they would dunk themselves in it before they entered into the temple as a, a picture of ceremonial cleansing. 
And so Peter is standing there and the other apostles, and everybody says, what must we do? And he says, change the way you think and be immersed in the name of Jesus. They understood the whole concept of that because that's why they went down to the Jordan River to be immersed by John. And we're told that Jesus went to, the, to Anon because there was a lot of water there when he was immersing people. And so to be immersed then was um, to express, for us it's an expression of salvation in Jesus, I should have stated that, and not the means. You're not saved by being baptized. It's an expression of what Jesus did for you, okay? But let's move on. It's an expression of your identification and your allegiance with Jesus. If you are over in the Muslim states right now, countries, you can believe in Isa. Isa's in the, uh, in the Quran. And so when I, when I witness the, the, the Islamic Muslim people, I talk about Isa. Isa's Jesus. Isa's a prophet. He's in the, in the Quran. Isa never lied. And so it's a lot of fun. So you can go there, and again, they're supposed to read the holy books, which includes the Old Testament and the New Testament. You need to know these things, okay, and be able to witness to them, okay? But the point is, so for that Islamic Muslim individual, they can believe in Isa. Because Isa is in, the, is in the Quran. But when they get baptized, immersed in the name of Jesus, in the name of Isa, that is turning their back on Muhammad and declaring Jesus as the one true God. Then a death penalty is placed upon them. We don't live in that kind of culture. We have missed it. But the importance of being immersed in the name of Jesus as an identification of allegiance with him is huge. It revealed your belief in the resurrection of Jesus. At that moment, when these individuals were, were expressing their identification and, and allegiance with Jesus, they weren't being baptized in order to be saved. They changed the way they thought, and now they're being immersed as a public demonstration, a public portrait to all those people who were watching. It was a line in the sand in front of the, all these people. This is a public thing. It's not like, you know, we're looking at building a new facility and we're debating, debating whether we're putting a, a baptistry immersion tank in the, in the sanctuary part of it or whether we're going to have like a, a landscaped kind of thing, pond outside that we can kind of go do that. Or, or do we not have either one of them still go to the, the, the lake, you know, or go to somebody's house? It's meant to be a public affair, a testimony of what's happened to you your belief in the resurrection of Jesus Christ for these individuals. And then finally, their cleansing. So again, this was spiritual cleansing that, that came, that you were cleansed, made righteous through Jesus Christ. So change the way you think, be immersed. Thirdly, be delivered and be saved. The word soteria is the word for deliver. So I'm riding down the road. My car goes off the road. <laughs> You know, it rolls over, bad accident. Uh, something ruptures my gas tank. Gas is coming out. Um, imminent explosion is going to go on. I can't get out of, of the car. You ride up. You see something's happened. You run up, and you go to open the door. You saw it was me, and you said, well, I'll do it anyway. And you rip open the door, and you, and you grab me out instead of leaving me in there for myself. And, and you, you pull out, and, and, you, you, and we dive into the, the ditch, right? And as you go into the ditch, <laughs> The car explodes. At that moment, you become my savior. You get it? But you're not my what? Eternal savior. I don't get to go to heaven because of that. But in a, moment, in a sense, you become my deliverer. Okay? So be careful every time you see the word saved, delivered, whatever, that you read into it, what we, we bring into it. It's, a, it's a, a, a normal word. It doesn't always mean eternal redemption. Okay? And so we read in Philippians chapter 2, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, um, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, 
work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Wait, I thought you said salvation wasn't of works, but now he's talking about working out your what? Your own salvation. But again, it's not necessarily talking about eternal redemption. It's talking about your deliverance here and now, okay? Because he continues on, work out your own deliverance with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Do all things without complaining and disputing. So he's not talking about redemption. He's not talking about eternal redemption. You don't go to heaven because you never complain and murmur. That's not what he's talking about. That you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Change the way you think. Be immersed in the name, identify yourself in the name of Jesus. And then what? Be delivered from this perverse generation that you live in. That's what we just saw in Ephesians. When we went through the book of Ephesians a couple months ago. Ephesians chapter 4. That you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk. In the futility of their minds. Having their understanding darkened and being alienated from the life of God. But rather you are to put off the old man and to put on the new man. You are to work in the process of deliverance on the earth today. Quickly, the decision of the people. 3,000 souls received the word and were added. What's fun about that is the parallel, and I don't have time to go into this. You can go back and look at these things. But in Exodus 19, you read that um, Shavuot occurs in the third month. Okay, so, Or the giving of the law, the Ten Commandments, occurs in the third month. I should state that. We know Shavuot is in the third month as well from Leviticus 23, right there, okay? Shavuot's in the third month, 50 days after the Feast of First Fruits. Um, the giving of the law, um, God comes down on the mountain with, uh, it's shaking in, in a mighty thunder. Think Pentecost. You got a mighty noise, a whole thing that brings people together, right? And then all of a sudden, not the law is given, but what's given? Grace is given. And at that time, Exodus 32, then 40 days later, so this is 40 days later, Moses goes up onto the mountain. He receives the law. He comes down, but they've already made a, a golden calf. A golden calf. Moses throws the tablets down. He breaks them, right? And then he calls out, and he says, Who is on Yahweh's side? Let them come to me. And the Levites came. And he says to them, draw out your sword. Pass through, the, pass through the camp. Kill your friends. Kill your brothers. Kill your mothers. Kill your fathers. Whoever doesn't come, who's never on the, whoever wasn't on the Lord's side, put your sword to them. And we're told on that day, 3,000 souls died. How cold is that? At the giving of the law, 3,000 souls were killed. At the giving of the gospel, 3,000 souls were given life. We know from the New Testament, and I don't have time to go into it, the law brings death. But it's not evil. It's because the wages of sin is death. The law brings awareness of my sin. So it doesn't bring the death in and of itself. It just brings the awareness of the death. So that... I can come to the grace of God by faith. And I can receive the life that we talked about from Ephesians chapter 2. So in the end, have you repented? Have you changed the way you think about Jesus? And have you called upon him to deliver you from your sins? Have you accepted him as the Lord of your life? Secondly, have you been immersed? Have you submitted to the plan of Jesus Christ? It's his plan. It's his command. And it's the sign which he has chosen by which his children, his followers, would be known by. Jesus said to his disciples, go out and make disciples, baptizing them, immersing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's a sign he chose. Have you submitted to him, not to us, not to this church, but have you submitted to him? 
Have you been delivered? Have you been delivered from this perverse generation, or are you still dabbling in its perverseness? Jesus came in order to deliver us from this crooked and perverse generation. Have you been delivered? Or are you still playing around? Is there then a need to change the way you think and change the way you act? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness to us. I thank you for the, the power of your word. And Lord, the conviction of your word. I give you the glory, Lord, for saving me from the eternal consequences of my sin. I give you the glory for saving me, even from the practical power of sin today. Lord, I pray for myself and for these others who are here. Father, that you would cause us to grow in your grace and knowledge. Cause us to grow in the fruit of the Spirit, the love, the joy the peace, the long-suffering, the kindness, the goodness, the gentleness, the faithfulness, the self-control. Lord, I pray if anyone's here today and they don't know you as their Savior, if they've never asked you into their hearts, if they're still trusting in their works, that you would call them to yourselves this day that they would submit to you. That they would even right now be asking you into their lives, confessing sin and asking you for forgiveness. Lord, be honored, be magnified, be glorified. In Christ's name, amen.